So last summer, a few of us uh, got together for a 10-week training on how to lead Bible studies in a different way. It's a great training. We learned a lot. But I heard a term during this training that I've never heard before. The term was called wig take. And it's an acronym that stands for what's it going to take. And basically, you use that to help you achieve a goal. So you have a goal, and then you work backwards asking, what's it going to take to get there? Let me give you an example. At the start of the year, Mike gave his goal of wanting to get more people reading the Bible. Okay, that's the goal. So what's it going to take to get there? So he came up with this daily reading program, put it out over social media and via text and everything, commenting, and now more people are reading the Bible every day. What's it going to take to get there? Now, there are some times that that phrase is used in a little bit different way. It's used to ask, what's it going to take to get you to do what I want you to do? You hear that a lot in, in car lots. A salesman might say to a potential buyer, what's it going to take to get you to drive this car away today? But sometimes, when that phrase is being used, it's a little bit more important than just buying a car. It's used to find your price. What's it going to take to get you to do something? Now, during men's breakfast and out in the uh, men's group in, in the morning on Sundays, a few weeks ago, we've been talking about the temptations of Jesus. And we've been, you know, talking about Satan trying to find Jesus' price. And the third temptation, Satan says, look, if you just bow down to me and worship me, I will give you all of the kingdoms of the world. Now, thankfully, Jesus doesn't have a price. So he said, no, end of story, done. But it brought up an interesting question. What's your price? What would it take to get you to turn away from God? Do you want to be rich and famous? Like if everybody in the world knew who you were and you never had to worry about money again, would that be enough to trade God for? What about your health? If you knew that you were going to live a long time healthy, happy life. Would that be enough to trade God for? What about your kids? If you knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that your kids would live a long, healthy, prosperous life and not have to go through any trials at all and just be happy and healthy and just have a fantastic life, would that be enough to trade God for? What's your price? That's the question that we're going to be wrestling with today. So we're going to keep on in our, in our sermon series on Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up to Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, as always, let Doug, Mike, or I or one of the elders know. We will make sure that we get you a Bible. If you're watching on Facebook and you don't have a Bible, but you would like one, put a comment, send us a private message, just get a hold of us somehow, we will send you a Bible. We're not going to charge you for it. We're not going to enroll you in a Bible study. It's just when I was a young Christian, somebody asked me if I had a Bible. And I said no, and they put a Bible in my hand, and it changed my life. And I would like to be able to do that same blessing towards somebody else. So if you need a Bible, let us know. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Like I said, we're going to be starting in verse 19. But before we do, you know, we missed a week last week. So let's have a little review. The last, last message that we heard, Doug was telling us about how, how Jesus was saying, okay, you need to do everything that you do, you need to do in secret. If you pray, pray in secret. If you give, give in secret. When you fast, do it secretly. Don't make a big show of all of this stuff. And if you do that, 
you will get a reward. And then Doug asked the question, what's the reward? Now, I'm sure that people, when they were listening to Jesus, while he was giving this Sermon on the Mount, I'm sure that they were thinking, man, what's the reward? Am I going to get a bigger house? Nicer clothes? Am I going to uh, have some fancy jewelry that just make me look just rich and, and awesome? What's that reward? And then Jesus seems to anticipate their thoughts. And so he goes in, in verse 19. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. If you were to walk into my garage right now, you would notice I have a lot of stuff. Now, some of those things, they're kind of sentimental to my wife and I. I mean, we both have a box of china from both of our grandparents that has been passed down to us. I have a box of newspaper front page headlines from historical events that my grandmother started and then passed it down to my mom, and now I have it to keep on adding to. These are things that we feel that they're perfectly fine sitting on a shelf in our garage. I mean, they're not outside. They're not going to get, get hurt by the weather. And, you know, nobody's going to take them. But there are some things in our house that we do not feel comfortable just leaving in our garage. I have a safe right next to my side of the bed that has all three of our passports. It has all three of our birth certificates. It has the titles to both of our cars. These are the things that we don't really feel comfortable just leaving them in a box in the garage because they're a little bit more valuable. They're a little bit more important to us. And so we put them in a safer location. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, you know, earth, it's only temporary. Heaven is eternal. So why not put your treasure in the safe place? Why not put your treasure up in heaven? So how do we do that? How do we put our treasure in heaven? I mean, I can only throw stuff so high. So how, how can you put that up in heaven? Well, Jesus actually answers that question later on in Matthew. He's talking with a, a rich guy, and the rich guy asks, well, how, how do I get eternal life? And Jesus says, Look, go sell, your, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. So, Jesus is saying, look, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. So, if your treasure is stored up in heaven, if you're not putting... Like Doug was saying during the communion thought, if you're not putting stuff above Jesus and above heaven, you're going to have treasure in heaven, and that's where your heart is going to be, and that's where your heart should be. That's where you should always be looking. So as we move on to the next part of the passage, Jesus continues, and he says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within your darkness, I'm sorry, if then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So when I was studying for this, I was using one of the books that I had when I was back in school. And it was all about the Sermon on the Mount. And it got to this passage and it says, you know, the Greek word for good or healthy seems to imply generous. And the Greek word for bad or unhealthy seems to imply stingy. So the passage actually reads, if your eye, I'm sorry, if your eyes are good or generous, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad or stingy, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
couple of weeks ago, I was teaching about Jesus telling us that we are the light of the world. And now he's coming back to being full of light. And he's telling us if we're to be the light of the world, the way to do that is to be generous. So when we decided to add another spot to our, our coffee ministry, put it right out here. We, uh, we decided we were going to do things a little bit different. Over at the train station, we have uh, store-bought donuts and church coffee. And that works out great. People are very, very happy about that. But we decided we're going to step our game up over here. We're going to advertise that we have Donut Land donuts. As an aside, if you've never had a donut from Donut Land, that's a little slice of heaven. You need to go there. So <laughs> then we're also advertising that we have Starbucks coffee. And that's one of our draws. Hey, we, we're putting out our best just so you guys come to see us. And we did that the first week, and I quickly realized, holy cow, this is going to cost us $50 a week. I don't know that we can afford to keep doing this. But the idea behind it, I mean, it, just, it was allowing us to have conversations and connect with people that would never be walking through those doors. So the idea, it seemed as if that was God's will. So we prayed and we decided, okay, we are going to be as generous as we can for as long as we can. And we'll see what happens. So about three weeks after we started, we got a letter in the mail. And it was a handwritten note from somebody who was driving by. And the note said, you know, I really appreciate seeing you guys out there waving and, and giving away coffee and donuts. And it's like you're, you're the church being the church. And I, I really appreciate that. And I'd, I'd like to help out. And he included a check for $1,000. And then, I mean, $1,000, $50, $50 a week, that lets us keep on being generous for a little bit longer. So then, people just started giving us Money. I mean, we don't have a tip jar out there. We don't. We advertise that everything is free. We don't ask for money. There's nothing that says that we want money. But people just started giving us money. A couple dollars here, five dollars there. And so we put that in like a little fund. And we started adding that to a Starbucks gift card. So that would kind of take care of our coffee. About once every other week, that money would take care of our coffee. Well, when I go into Starbucks every Friday they started to notice, wait, why don't you ask for cups? I mean, when you get to the travelers, usually everybody wants the cups and everything. Why don't you want cups? And I explained to them what, what we were doing, that we were giving their coffee away when we buy it. They said, wow, that's a great idea. We, were, we want to get involved in that. So tell you what, we'll just put you on a BOGO program. So you buy it one week, we'll give it to you the next week. And so now... We're not spending nearly that much on coffee. So we started putting the money that we were getting towards donuts. And we've been doing this for probably six to seven months, being as generous as we can for as long as we can. And Jesus just keeps on blessing our socks off. He said, keep on doing what you're doing. And I didn't know how long it was going to last. And the fact that Jesus has kept on blessing it has told us, keep doing it. Keep being as generous as you can, and I'll tell you when to stop. So, as we keep on going, our final part of the passage, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I want to make sure that I explain something as clearly as I possibly can here. There is nothing wrong with money. A lot of people will misquote the Bible and they'll say, well, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. No, no, no. That's a misquote. What it actually says in 1 Timothy is, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the path or wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. If you have a job that pays you a lot of money, fantastic, that's great. But if you start 
craving that money and the things that you can buy with that money, that's when all of a sudden you start to have a little bit of a problem because you're starting to put that money and those things above Jesus. Now he says, you cannot serve two masters. You have to have a number one on your priority list. So what is that? What are you going to put your attention to? And with that, Jesus brings us right back to where we started. What is your price? What's above Jesus on your priority list? What's it going to take to get you to turn away from God? So last week was Valentine's Day. And it was actually Kim and my 20th Valentine's Day together. Now, I know that there are a lot of people here that 20 years is in your rearview mirror. And when we talk to you, when Kim and I talk to those couples, and when we watch you couples, we think, what's it going to take to get there? What's it going to take to get to 30 years? What's it going to take to get to 40 years? What's it going to take to get to 50 years and beyond? Now, everybody will have different answers to that. But one thing that is on everybody's list is it's going to take love. And this book is a book of love. This book tells the story of God's love. And one of the most popular passages we talked about just a couple of weeks ago in the daily, daily Bible reading plan, John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So God was asked, what's it going to take to get my people back to me? The question that God was posed, what's it going to take to get people back to God? And when the answer was his son, he never even flinched. He said, okay, if that's what it takes to get my people back to me, that's what I'm going to do. When Jesus was about to be crucified, he started to get a feeling of what was going to happen. And he asked, what's it going to take to get God's will done? And when he started to understand that it would be a gruesome, violent death, he said, okay, I will do that. So with that in mind, let me ask you, if you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus, what's it going to take? What's it going to take to make Jesus the top of your priority list? I mean, Jesus has been with you since before you were born. He's always been right there. He's never been more than one step away, and all it takes is for you to take one step towards him. So what's it going to take to make you take that step. If you have decided to make Jesus the Lord of your life, what's it going to take to get you to take another step towards him? What's it going to take to get you to start reading the Bible every day? What's it going to take for you to join a home group? What's it going to take to get you to start serving in church? What's it going to take? Jesus has been right there your whole entire life, just waiting for you. What's it going to take for you to make that decision? Let's pray. Lord in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for your love. Thank you for never even flinching when you realize what the price would be for us. Lord, thank you for paying that price, and thank you for just always being with us. Lord, it's truly in your name that we pray. Amen.